What we're looking for here is the precise, the least amount of exercise required. The logical place to start, even if you're skeptical, is with the least amount possible. The logical place to start is not with an arbitrary number like 20, but with the least amount possible. In other words, if one set doesn't work, you can't go any lower to find the least amount necessary. You can't do zero sets and have a workout. If one set doesn't work, you could always go to two. But I can save you the time and the headache. I've already worked it out. I've trained over 400 people, closer to 500 people now over the last four and a half years. One set per exercise and never more than two sets per muscle is all that's needed. That's just the way it is. And if you're incredulous, you're skeptical. The reason for that is that you still have operative in your subconscious the childlike logic that more is better. And if more is really better, as they imply, then why not do 200 sets? Why stop at 20? Where did they ever get the number 20 anyway? It's literally arbitrary. Remember, science is an exact, an exacting discipline. There's no room for the arbitrary in science. What is up, Physique Friday fam, Iconocasters? It is uh, episode 41. We are officially over the hill. It's all uphill from here. We, we've, we've hit our peak, and we're going beyond it. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, you know, got a, little, got a little something going on here. A little something right here. Uh, we we produced pinnacle, some. We're going higher. That's right. So this is the time uh, of big changes. This is the the fulcrum, the pivot point. Uh, we have released some sick merch, guys. These shirts are absolutely incredible. Um, I've had some shirts by this manufacturer, and they've lasted me over two years. The print, the fit, everything about them, the quality, um, absolutely stellar. I'll say this. If you go with your normal size, it's going to be a nice athletic fit T-shirt. If you want something that's a little oversized, a little looser, but it's still going to fit you good in the shoulders and upper body, go a size up. So um, incredible shirts, incredible quality, incredible fit. <clears throat> so we have sizes large through extra large. I did not make smaller shirts because, frankly, I mean, unless you're four foot nine, <laughs> you know, you should be wearing a large, guys. And large if you're not, at least. Then you haven't been watching the damn show, <laughs> right? If if you're if you're five six and one hundred thirty five pounds, you haven't been paying attention. Okay, it's time for a bulk mandatory. You bulk. don't need it. You don't need a shirt. You need a consultation with myself or with Natty Duty. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I didn't make smaller shirts because I'm a bully, and frankly, you fall in line or you stay behind. Um, that may be bad marketing. But you know what? Fuck it. I want excellence. I want people rocking these shirts to represent what we do here. I don't want any scrawny pencil necks, you cookie cutters. Okay, <laughs> wearing my merch. All right. I want Aryan studs, succulent, want, dense mofos, crushing it, thick killing boys. it. Thick boys. Okay. It's my. I, I, I've been on a Bugenhagen kick. For like a long time. So <laughs> Sticky Ricky has left his impression on me. Shout out That's to hilarious. Eric Buguez. I love that dude. He's wild. You may not have it all together, you know, scientifically speaking, but but does he bring the intensity? And that's what's yeah, important. So um, also another announcement, guys, on the same Gumroad where you're going to be able to purchase our shirts at the Physique Friday Gumroad Shop. Also, episodes 1 through 30 are archived now, So, or 1 through 29. What is up on the YouTube is just going to be our most recent stuff, our last 10 episodes. But if you want access to the archive, there's a $5 paywall. It helps us out. It helps you out. Look, guys, in the 
library of content we produce. There is everything there. There's everything you need there to put together a program, how to understand training philosophy, how to do your nutrition. I mean, how to pick your exercise selection. It's all there. It's all there. How to have a, the right mindset. Okay. You just got to watch the show. If you don't want to watch the show, but you want all of that stuff, well, that's the next tier and it's a lot more expensive. Okay. That's one on one coaching. But I mean, for five bucks, you could literally figure all this shit out with all the content we put down and have a real good time figuring it out along the way. Okay. So, yeah, this helps us. We're helping you. There it all is. Okay. I'm not going to harp on that too long. Let's get to business. Well, that was kind of business, but let's get to fun. Gage, how was your week? The week was good. Um, busy at work, like always. Um, we did a nine-mile hike to a waterfall last Friday, so that was sick. That was awesome. Um, but, yeah, things are good. It's getting hot out here in Arizona, so I had to turn the air conditioner on today, which sucked. But it is what it is. I was going to say, it doesn't seem like there's many uh, waterfalls in Arizona, but seeing how you had to hike nine miles to see one, I guess that kind of <laughs> represents what's going on. <laughs> yeah, they're there. You just got to go hike to them. You got to find them. You, you just got to trek it for for uh, nine hours or nine miles. Well, probably nine yeah. hours. I don't know. We started at nine, got done at one. So four hour, four hour hike. Not terrible. Four hour hike. Yeah. It's not bad. You guys were booking it, Dan. You guys were cruising. Yeah, 1,500 feet we went down and then had to hike that back out. So, yeah, it was pretty sick. The trail was honestly super easy, like super flat, nothing crazy. But, um, yeah, man, Arizona's got some hidden gems out here. People think it's all desert, but we've got we got some sweet things going on out here. Yeah, I mean, from what I understand, it's beautiful country. Utah, Arizona, I mean, everywhere has got beautiful country. You just got to know where to look. I mean, exactly. if you're from Louisiana, you don't think it's pretty until other people see it. And they're like, oh, my gosh, it's so green out there. It's so pretty. I appreciate it. You got to remind you. Yeah, man. When you when you stare at the same thing for too long, you kind of you lose uh, the appreciation. You know, there's yeah. beauty in everything. You just got to have the mindset to see it. Got to put the glasses on to see it. Yeah. Yeah. You got to put your blue light glasses on at night so you sleep good. <laughs> What about you? Week's good? Yeah, apparently I'm getting fucking huge. Uh, my training partner has been gone for three weeks, and he walked when he saw me walk into the gym today, he's like, dude, you're getting big. And uh, we trained That's legs. Insane. It was insane. And then I was helping him with his posing because he's prepping for a bodybuilding show, and we were hitting some poses, and he's like, yeah, dude, your arms are bigger than mine now. So, yeah, things are things are moving along. Things are going yep. up, baby. Steady, steady on the rise to be expected. I mean, you know, we're doing everything right. I, uh, we do it? I have a scientific system, like Mincer said in the uh, in the intro of the show. Man, I'm really appreciating that intro. I was watching Dude, every it time so I'm... hard before the show started. What an amazing edit! What an amazing edit! What um, a powerful speech there. I mean, this is nothing short of completely scientific. You can know exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it, and that it will 100% produce, produce results. And I am a living testament to that. You are a testament to that. Every client we coach is a testament to that. You know, I got guys that are morphing in like three weeks. And they're all that surprised. Was insane. Like, that was insane. I'm not, I'm not too surprised. <laughs> yeah. But no, that yeah. dude is... He's, he's got things coming. True. Kyle, yeah, he's got incredible genetics for sure. I can't wait to see what he does at his, at his first bodybuilding competition. It's going to be nuts. With you guiding him, he should probably win that thing easily. Yeah, I would expect it. You know, with those kind of genetics and the, exactly the right plan in place, that dude's going to win an overall title. That dude could turn pro before I do, and he's never stepped on stage yet. <laughs> Well, that's and I can it. already tell by looking at him, but that's what it's about, baby. You want to have the the, the cream of the crop rises to the top. Mm. Cream of the crop <laughs> rises to the top. Uh, 
and the yeah. rest uh, participate, and the rest will eventually fall into infighting and groveling over um, not sticking to their stupid ideas for too long. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> yeah. uh, our great friend and mentor Alexander Bromley is a uh, is mad at Mike Isertel for something, probably because he is a closet hit lover, but has to, but he's not selling the uh, the full volume branding anymore. So. He's Let's coming take around. a look at that. Let's see what's going on there. That ought to be fun. This ought to be fun. They've jumped. Yeah, you're fun. Shark. You're set for life. The Lambo jokes are a little bit weird now that you can actually afford to buy many, many Lambos from the multiple millions of dollars you've made. It's time to stop. All right. So we have some drama between Jeffrey Verity Schofield and the GOAT, Dr. Mike. Does Jeff know what he's getting into? This is like Toto landing in Tokyo to go against a kaiju level lizard. Much like this jacked Godzilla <laughs> in the Big Dreams Bad Jeans tee that is linked below and available at barbellapparel.com. And you got to know that Mike's a PhD, which is like as close as you can get to a modern day warlock as possible. Like once you go to school, you graduate, you get the piece of paper, it basically gives you unrestrained ability to manipulate the laws of physics. You can build shit, cure diseases, invent new technologies. Oh, what's that? That's physicists, engineers, and doctors? Well, what's his degree? Oh, exercise science. Pro athletes must need that in order to advance. Oh, really? Well, novices surely. No, not novices? Really? Holmes said it's not to tell you what to do on a Tuesday? Well, guys, what the fuck is it for? Anyways, I'm still gonna give it up to Dr. Mike. He's an absolute titan. Who's Jeffrey Verity Schofield, a sumo-pulling natty bodybuilder who moved to China so his average Caucasian genetics would just look bigger by comparison? And when I saw this set, I was like, okay, it's time. This video just has to be made. It needs to be. So wait, wait, wait. We got, we got, we got Israel versus Schofield. Man, that's mm. it's yeah. a battle. It's a weird battle. You got, anything, you got anything to say about Israel versus Schofield? I honestly Holy didn't shit. even really know. I didn't even really know who Schofield was until we, we we shared this in the group. But I was looking into him a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't really know a whole lot about him yet. Other I'm than that, he's a the, uh, Yeah, I'm. I'm just looking at the. You know, I just I'm trying to know I'm trying to nose what's going on between Israel and Schofield. Okay, we got you smell them out. We got, yeah, we got Russian Jew versus Chinese immigrant Jew over here. Um, wow, I can already predict the uh, absolute nonsense that's about to take place. This will be interesting. Get the porridge out. Why I haven't made this video for so I long. love the Jewish that people. I never want to. I just want that to be known. You don't even got That's to say on email. record. That is on the internet. That is on video. <laughs> Nothing but love. <clears throat> What's your love? Shalom. <laughs> <sighs> Feel like I'm punching down. I never want to be doing harm. I never want to have like that cyber bullying type of feel to my content. TurboTax Live, full service. Take he's taxes punching off down, your... huh? He's, he's hitting Mike on the on the short end of the spectrum there. Oh, Punch oh, down, oh. huh? Brutal. And it's like if this I'm guy's punching through punch up, fucking fuck am I bags of uh, jokes aside. powdered donuts. We're on a contentious topic about the nature of optimization, which is an industry buzzword that's being fueled by all the guys with the letters after their name. And it's an important discussion when finding what is optimal is going to be the vital prescription that jettisons you past your current plateau. And when it's hey, just babe, going to be some small distraction that low level lifters use to hunker down in their ideologically a peanut based jelly. sense of identity. The answer to that, of course, is Almond never and jelly. always. I'm a fan of Dr. Mike generally because he usually has that very measured, very point practical point. takes. But lately, he's been giving in to some OCD level fuckery that seems to be have... more driven by the need to continue branding Wait, the Renaissance periodization name than it is driven by the need to tell the target audience the most important things they need to hear to take them from where they are to where they want to go. Jeff made this video in response to the technique cyborg bit that Isertel has on his Instagram page, where he displays the absolute most strict adherence to technique to show 
all of the other followers who has the whitest sneakers. You can't make it on there if you have any Kool-Aid stains on them. You gotta drink all of it. But surely this is an overreaction. I mean, a lot of lifters skip over technique. It's important to make sure they're moving correctly and starting that early, right? To build good habits. How bad could this be? What the f was that, dude? <laughs> Jesus Christ, what the fuck is this? Even the regular commentators couldn't believe what they were saying. So Jeff broke this down into two basic parts. He talked about the need for control and load management as one, and on the other hand, range All right, of I, I just want to, uh, <laughs> here's, the, here's the thoughts, uh, the Primarchs, what's going on in the Primarchs head as I watch this. Um, these guys will focus on anything but what actually works. <laughs> you know, like being so utterly meticulous over technique and all of the periodization scheming, but having no fucking clue um, of the basics of exercise science. And what I mean by intensity being the driver of hypertrophy, that volume is always a net negative, that the frequency of training should reduce and not increase, you know, stuff like that, like simple shit like that, like having a, um, a set of heuristics to apply, you know, to back up your, your exercise science philosophy, having objective measurable variables that you could test every week in the gym. Bromley doesn't have that. Isertel doesn't have that. Um, whoever this scrawny cyborg nerd is, he doesn't have that either, but they infight in there, <laughs> you know, they, uh, <laughs> They Back and forth argue over, over whose things. hat's the smallest. Wild. Content. Our fixations of the technique Puritans. In general, if you are able to move the weight with such speed that it looks like a warm-up, it's not a working set. It's not a working weight. You should go up in weight. So if you're doing let's say some kind of machine and you're absolutely slamming the machine at the bottom of the range of motion, it's probably too light. And it's that fitness pendulum. It goes back and forth. This is a response to the ego lifting, the partials, people lifting too heavy. Well, this is just a different form of ego. You're attaching your ego, not to the weight lifted, but to the range of motion. And the idea of mastering a certain level of weight before going up, is very appealing especially if you are very risk averse but ultimately i think sometimes that leads to people being much too timid with their progressive overload and even with their levels of effort progressive overload and effort those two things will get you very fucking far and if you're missing yeah. those this dude's right you just won't I think Dr. This Mike's content right. really appeals to people who like to have a lot of control over what they do in the gym. And so I thought about giving a bar speed or a rep speed, either in terms of how many seconds it takes to complete a rep. If it's faster than that, it's going to be useless. But I specifically will not give you numbers, you fucking nerds. I like geeking out about this shit as much as anyone, but it's not <laughs> It's a lot to you. You need to but... feel it. You need to feel what a rep is too easy. And you're like, okay, well, I can go heavier than I thought. So the speed absolutely does matter. It matters most in the last few reps leading up to right. failure. If you follow the effective reps know. model, which is not complete by any stretch, but it's a pretty good heuristic for figuring out if your set was worth a damn or not. You want to look. Well, he used the word I use. Pushing as hard as possible, which gets maximal <laughs> motor unit recruitment. But also the weight is involuntarily slowing you down. Here's another term I use all the time. That's the first time because I heard Bromley say some shit, half ass shit. The basic idea for why it's we coming think along. those reps are so vitally important. But the problem that we see is people believing strongly that A, perfect technical execution matters and b this is what technical execution looks like when done perfectly because that will become the technical cap that many stop at when they can't reenact that perfect execution anymore no matter what is fatigue it. sets in the what you want to see what you viewer what you want to see uh in your reps that actually matters is when they slow down baby involuntary slowing of the implement that makes an effective rep. When it goes slower, no matter how hard you push, fantastic. That's great. Now take that one step further and make it completely fucking stop, okay? Against your will. And then Boom. go backwards and you can't stop it. It's called failure. 
And uh, that's better than doing three sets with some slowing. You could get everything done in one set to failure. Probably won't tell you that, but he's said some some big words, some nice words that I like. Heuristics, that's a great word. Um, involuntary effective slowing. Reps, I like yeah, that. Effective reps. Did he say involuntary slowing? I think he did. Yeah, he said he said that. Um, he did say involuntary slowing. So he's. I'm jonesing so bad for some food right now. <laughs> I am like, I'm not even here. <laughs> uh, your skeleton's there. Yeah. Brain's gone. Yeah. My brain's gone and it's eating my body. Yeah. I think really quickly, I used to, I was the same way. Like I got to like a point, you know, training my whole life, I would be, form was always in focus, but like, once you start focusing all of your attention on form, your weight goes down. You're not pushing as much weight. And you, you, I don't know. You just don't make as many gains. Like f- your form can still be good and still push good weight, but you don't need to be doing this like crazy range of motion, uh, you know, for every single rep, for every single thing. Here's something I started like, for instance, my last uh, chest day, I wasn't able to record it, but. I have a lot of work that I need done on my tendons, you know, the connective tissue in my shoulders to my chest, all these insertion areas in my upper body, but really tight and it affects how I pose. And, you know, I need tendon work done. So what I did when I trained was I focused on some really deep stretching and I had to go down on weight. Now, when I'm doing those kind of movements, the form has got to be absolutely meticulous. Because, I mean, you know, I'm not going to put myself in that compromised position with some uh, 100-pound dumbbells doing flies, you know. Yeah. (laughs) It's just not the time for that, right? Um, I think there's a time and a place for that kind of meticulous uh, focus on form, and that's when you're wanting to access something. um, A new range of motion, yeah. kind of Right. Like for myself, you know, I'm wanting to stretch. I'm wanting to stretch out these tendons. I'm wanting to loosen these things up. To, yeah, for I, for a different goal, you know, to be able to to pose better, to be more opened up, so that these tissues can continue to grow. But that's just a phase. Yeah, it's not like something you you're fucking hammering every single time, and you know, going crazy with the weight. I did the same thing two chest sessions ago on the pec deck. I put the weight down, and and I same thing as you. I just wanted to get a really really good stretch, and um, yeah, like you said, the weight was way low, but um, yeah a good stretch at the time when I needed it, it, it felt really good. Yeah. Like my last set of flies, my last exercise for chest was a, a set of flat dumbbell flies. And I was using like 40 pound dumbbells. Now, if you go on my Instagram, <laughs> like two years ago, I'm doing incline flies with 100 pound dumbbells, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Those made me grow. The 40 pound ones are helping to open me up so that I can, you know, feel better in my training and take those heavy weights further and more effectively. But the, the guideline that you should have as far as your form is, is uh, get a peak muscular contraction and keep your reps as uniform as possible until they can't be uniform, which is when, um, the reps get nasty and effective when they start to Absolutely. slow down and the form starts to break down a little bit, you know, right before failure happens. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. That's okay. But the ones leading up to it, just make them uniform, you know, yeah, make them you don't good. need a, you don't need a, a six point uh, process to figure out if your reps are perfect. You know, there shouldn't be 1800, there shouldn't be 18 different cues to your uh, single joint movement on a machine. Like, get the <laughs> fuck out of here, dude. <laughs> like, you're thinking way too hard about it. You're missing all the other stuff. I liked what Gray Shirt said, what Schofield said, which was uh, effort. Uh, and something else will get you a real long way. Progressive overload. <laughs> yeah, progressively overloading and effort. Man, that's... That's the yeah, like I, I'd rather I'd rather be able to bet you know move two hundred pounds on a on a press than do 
you know, with, with a certain range than do like, you know, a hundred pounds with this amazing form, you know, like you said, if you, if you're trying to stretch things open, you know, go for that. But like, yeah, that progressive overload and effort, man, is going to freaking kill it. And like, you know, I'm big on my form and my technique. Oh yeah. But I'm not autistic here. about it. Exactly. We're not so crazy about it. Like, you know, we're moving 10 pound dumbbells because we were so psycho over some kind of form on something. <laughs> you know, when I give someone a cue, like when they're training, like I give them a cue or a pointer, they don't need to reduce the weight by 75 fucking percent. Yeah. Thousand percent. You know what I mean? They're like, they're like, Oh shit, that made it feel heavier. Like that made it feel better. Um, and they're probably using the same weight or maybe a little bit less, but it's cues to get them a better contraction, a better mind muscle connection, not to create these extreme ranges of motion that will actually inhibit how far they can push in a set. You know, I've, I've talked about it in many of my different training blogs that there are certain parts in a rep that make it less effective. You know, Paul Carter put up a big study on the tricep, for example, and the tricep experiences way more growth from a, a more lengthened position to a completely contracted position, as opposed to an extreme lengthened position. Um, yeah, partial extension. Right. One produces way more growth than the other. And it's the, um, it's from shortened to partially lengthened instead of from fully lengthened to partially lengthened. This one is not near as effective for growth as this to this is. And one of the things that my meathead brain thinks is that it's because this point is so much fucking harder to break over. It produces so much more shear forces on your joints and your connective tissues. And it takes so much more effort to get out of that point to get to the effective part of the rep. So ideally, you know, don't worry about that super freaking lengthened crap. It's not important. What's important is, is getting the peak contraction, keeping stuff uniform, and just freaking hogging it. Go hard. Stop being a freaking pencil neck. Quit being a nerd. Just move the weight. That's a really big problem these days. Is everybody wants to focus on all this damn minutia and miss the key points. All right, roll the video. The I'm going to myself so I can eat. Reps, they just fucking look different. There's no two ways about it. Like we gauge the effectiveness of reps according to the concept of failure, but even that is kind of arbitrarily defined because at the extreme, you have myo reps and drop sets and Dorian Yates level intensity, but then you have concentric failure with sloppy technique as you begin to cheat. We have concentric failure with strict technique. We have volitional failure. And if you're determining failure off of this imaginary idea of perfect technique, it's going to lead you to stop the set way, way, way early from where the muscle potentially needs to be stimulated in order to get a substantial amount of growth. We talk a lot about weight and effort, and that's certainly relevant, but really that's the thing that tells us that we actually pushed hard enough to trick the body into responding and hoarding more tissue. Now, this is evident in certain movements where the leverages actually get worse as you go through them. Now, usually with things like squatting, pressing, and deadlifting, it starts out difficult at the bottom and then it gets easier as you go up. So by the time you hit fatigue, you are already grinding at the start and then grinding through the rest of the rep. You're not launching weights off your chest. However, with rows, like we see this fine gentleman doing, the leverages get worse, meaning it's like pulling against bands or accommodating resistance. And what that means is that if you're looking for that picture perfect touch at the top, that means at no point during the bottom and mid range, are you actually stressed that once you get just fatigued enough that you can't complete that last rep, you shut it down. And you left a lot of work on the table because with movements like that, you can keep flinging it halfway up long after you've reached the point of that kind of arbitrary definition of technical failure. And I honestly believe that's one of the reasons that so many back exercise benefit from kind of looser technical standards. Now, when you look Look at this Hold the up. question is of course like which one since when does this motherfucker care about failure in training <laughs> i don't know you know on. wait what's he what do you want about bromley like you're the high volume guy like you you think that rate of perceived exertion is an actual thing and that you don't have to train to failure and that volume is king like why are you spurging out about failure right now and then like to make it that failure is some kind of arbitrary concept 
And of course, the classic tactic of describing failure with every other way than what simple failure would be. You know, oh, well, there's the ultra intensity. Oh, Dorian Yates. Oh, I do some Dorian Yates. How many freaking triple drop sets did Dorian Yates do in his training? What? Didn't he just like have like a maybe a rep or two past failure or like an assisted rep? And that mm-hmm. was it? Hell, I never even seen Dorian Yates do like an extreme rest pause set like I would do. You know what I mean? Like, what? These guys got to blow it way out of proportion to make it absurd so that they can taper it back. And then, oh, I'm an expert on the matter. Mm-hmm. Nah. The Same shot. old song and dance. Same old song and dance, man. And his best. And that's a trick question, you goober. I don't know. All of them. None of them. It depends. And even if you could standardize like one best method of technical execution, you could apply to all lifts which you absolutely can't, you failing to squeeze out every last drop of optimization out of your lift with your technique is not going to be the thing that's keeping you from that next jump. And it sure as shit is not the thing keeping the droves of Renaissance periodization viewers from getting something that looks like a basically muscular physique. So I think Jeff hit the nail on the head here when he talked about effort and progressive overload. It's the 80-20 rule. It's the big rocks, bro. Just like any productivity or self-help book, any business or management manual, anything that has ever tried to get people who engage in high stakes environments to put together systems that predictably work better. You have limited time, effort, resources, you take them, you focus them on the big shit. You make sure that you're getting 10 out of 10 scores on that stuff before you even consider taking the leftover energy and applying it to smaller things. This is an example of the exact opposite. That's really good advice. To start with a surgical That's approach. really good now, advice. And if that was will. the only thing Bromley ever said, that would be mint. <laughs> you know, because like that's <laughs> perfect. Roll that back 20 seconds and play through that again. Have limited time, effort, resources. You take them, you focus them on the big shit. You make sure that you're getting 10 out of 10 scores on that stuff before you even consider taking the leftover energy and applying what it are to those things, things, Gage? This is an ex- What are the things you should be getting 10 out of 10s on, Gage? The heavy compounds, the heavy lifts. Yeah. Like get more on a No, 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 no. Get more on a big fundamentals. Fundamentals, baby. Oh, fundamentals. High intensity. Get get, train harder, less frequently. (laughs) Yes. Prioritize what? Intensity. Train to absolute fucking failure. You know? When it when it when your rep stops moving, that's good. Then progressively overload that. Yeah, I took it as like physical at first, but yeah, yeah. Fucking do what you need to do. Put in more effort to do it less often. Yes. You should be putting in so much effort that you can't even be in the gym five days a week. That's moving the big rocks. That's getting shit done. When you train so so hard hard that you can't keep going, that things like uh, set numbers of volume are no longer important. Because frankly, yeah. you can only do as much volume as you can handle. Like you're really knocking it down. Like that, those are the base rocks is intensity, recovery, and figuring out the frequency which you can maintain those other two. That's what's important. That's what matters. It's not, you know, squatting. It's not deadlifting. It's not doing this exercise. It's not having all these the the cues and the minutia and the meal timing and all this other kind of stuff that is minutia most people miss those first three things i said and worry about everything else and frankly guys if you're trying to put together a badass hypertrophy program and you're at the intermediate level and you're not a total noob you don't need to be doing freaking heavy barbell rows every time you go to the gym you don't need to be squatting you don't even need to be doing a bench press you could probably eliminate most of your compound movements and see better results why because single joint movements are superior for stimulating hypertrophy it's about a fatigue ratio you know when bromley's talking about what are all these different levels of failure in compound movements well like it's um your your failure is from fatigue you know your failure is from nervous system overload your failure is from your cardio giving out your failure is from perceived exertion it's not actually even strict muscular failure and that's why you got to have the right kind of um heuristics you got to have the right philosophy on your training before you even step in because if you don't then you'll end up chasing all these circles um you're you know going in circles with all these different things like these guys are arguing about 
These guys don't even have those fundamentals that we said, and they're arguing about everything else. They're all twisted up. Yeah, it was like my Sample last back exactly. day. I did. Um, it's like you said. It's hard to get. To, it's hard to get to true failure on rack pulls, but that was my main lifter. I did uh, uh, like a medium depth rack pull for you know just to stimulate my erectors, um, my grip, my arms. But I did. Um, I did what I worked up to one set to failure, and my body was was pretty shot. But it wasn't. It wasn't like my back and everything was 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 given out. But like my nervous system, you know, I was like, holy shit, you know, this was this was heavy. This was intense. So, yeah. And then I did one one working set of single arm Meadows rows, and that was my whole. That was all my back work because I was so fatigued and shot from the rack pulls. Which I want to get strong at rack pulls again. That's why I'm doing them. You know, and um, they're not the the most amazing for stimulating specific back you know, growth for your lats. But overall, you know, I just want to, I want to lift heavy shit again. So it's like, you don't need, if you're doing a heavy rack pull, you don't need to do four more exercises after, you know, or anything. And I did one set for biceps. That was my whole back and bicep day. So it was, yeah, like you said, it's, you're, you're, you're going to get fatigued and worn out doing some of those heavy lifts versus true muscular failure. But if you understand that, it's okay. You know, you, if you if you understand, hey, this isn't going to stimulate my lats as amazing as a single arm row or, you know, a bent over row or something. It's like, <clears throat> it's all good. Just want to get stronger yeah, rack pulls again. You weren't going into the gym with the idea that the rack pull was going to be your most optimal thing for hypertrophy and that you're going right. to focus on all these minute details on how to perfectly execute the rack pull to produce a result that's impossible. Right. Mm -hmm. You went in and said, I want to lift a heavy fucking rack pool. Yep. That's my goal. Yep. So simple. <laughs> right. Yep. So simple. And then you knew after the rack pulls, I am too tired to do a bunch of other stuff. That stuff yep. would be useless and pointless and counterproductive. So what those, do one what those rows. Yeah. But those rows that I did do, oh man, my, you know, my, I was, my nervous system was fired up from the rack pull. So I had those rows were freaking amazing and then my curls felt my curls i i broke another pr on straight bar curls um so i mean yeah it's you got to understand what you're doing why you're doing it so important yeah i had an awesome systematic destruction of legs today it was incredible did a sissy squat on the hacks on the hack squat a sissy hack squat torch my quads then went over and did a single leg press on a okay. uh, on that Cybex machine, that was gnarly. Then, bro, <laughs> then we did uh, belt squat RDLs. Ooh. So I attached the handle to the station of the belt squat and did RDLs with that. Soon, it was amazing. Mm. Went up and did some calves and abs, and that was it, bro. Trashed. So good, so good. All in the system. All in the mindset. Let's see what they're talking about. What are they fussing about? Consider taking the leftover energy and applying it to smaller things. This is an example of the exact opposite of that. This is getting people to start with a surgical approach. Now, eventually you will find small details that have the potential to be the thing holding you back. The pebble in your shoe, so to speak. And getting that fucker out is gonna be the thing that allows you to finish the marathon instead of getting crippled early on and then getting a gnarly infection. But there is a world of difference between addressing those problems as they pop up and treating every problem and every strategy as something that needs that surgical amount of attention. Because if you do that, you're only going to be able to focus on so many things. And if you're patting yourself on the back for how well you do it, it's only because your memory and attention span is so limited. You're not aware of all of the other things you physically don't have the resources to pay that same level of attention to. Dr. Mike said that Ronnie I think would I like be Bradley bigger if he had squatted deeper. Fuad, fuck up out of here. Look at this shit. What the no, no, get, get the fuck out of here. What is he doing here? What is he doing? His ass is touching his fucking heels. Please, and, dude, please. Come There's on, get the fuck out of here. On. Get out of here. What is no, he no, doing no, here? No, no, no. How much hubris do you have to have to not even say maybe, but just Ronnie would be bigger if he squatted deeper? And if you look at a lot of very, very jacked individuals, both enhanced and natural, they don't train with extreme ranges of motion, usually. They're not doing deadlifts where they're in this hyper deficit and they're getting this ultra lengthened position. Not really. In terms of your weight training, 
often you have to sacrifice so much weight on the bar that it's just not challenging the other part of the range of motion. Now, a lot of people are commenting that none of the guys demonstrating this stuff is jacked, which is true. And it's not proof that the techniques don't work, but you do wonder why a company that has so many people, so much money, so many resources to dedicate to social media, why they wouldn't be trying to find the best examples they have that would actually fit their branding. I mean, wouldn't you want to feature better role models, more developed lifters that would inspire other people to do things the right way? So people kind of have rationally any. come to the conclusion <laughs> that there really aren't any. Oh, but here Mike said him and Jared Feather do it this way. So case closed. Now that type of rationale also fuels the cult of personality because it does not fucking matter what any one person does. It doesn't matter if it's your favorite lifter, if it's one world champion, it doesn't matter if it's you. That approach that allowed those people to do well is not the same as the consensus from which we can pull the best approaches that tend to be true for the greatest number of people. It's not enough to point to a few shit studies when you have over a century of strength. That's where we come in, Gage. based entirely on <laughs> right, and the studies, baby. You have millions of people over all these years chasing very, very high stakes to find what works. And the overwhelming trend is that big people don't tend to do this shit. Now, is that set in stone? Of course not. But you need something better than this limited body of evidence and overconfident extrapolations if you want to overturn that wisdom. If the truth is, A, that this is universally better for everyone, and B, it's better by such a margin that the difference is going to show itself in a very clear way to the point where you're actually not justified doing it any other way, that should be really fucking easy to demonstrate. But we don't see that trend, so we have to conclude that it's not universally better, that there's exceptions, that there's trade-offs, or that it's better by such a pathetic margin that nobody's justified on wasting a single synapse on. Go work on your sleep journal. Go recalculate your macros. Go plan out next week's workout so you know exactly ahead of time how that training session is going to be better and more stressful than the one before it. You could go work on your shit flexibility. You could do prehab work, GPP, do some cardio. You can go out and talk to people and get sunlight and make friends in a way that's going to improve your mental health and allow you to attack your training with more vigor and confidence. You can do anything. Just close out PubMed and get off the fucking internet. In fact, I would even go so far as to say that you might not that. need to absolutely standardize your technique. The idea that you need to be a cyborg, a robot, that you have to move like you are a machine, I just don't think is actually true. I think small fluctuations in how you move is totally fine, reasonable, natural, and might actually be beneficial in some way. Now, I wholeheartedly agree with this. One of the big problems with research is that it can't account for habituation. What happens over 12 weeks does not matter in a study because rate of growth does not persist indefinitely. If one thing was 10% more effective than something else in the confines of this study, you don't just continue to get that 10% improvement over time. You get stagnant, you stall out. And to get past that, you have to incorporate some amount of variation. So it's not about what's optimal right now. It's about what gives me any return and what can I manipulate. We know what's not about to be said continuously find that return. And Israel talks about this. It's baked into his brand. Renaissance. Oh, there goes Bromley. Is deliberate. Bromley want, telling you to switch to all these other adaptations. A set structure over time that allow you to intelligently stack together these variables to get the best possible result over time. He talks about the power of novel exercise selection. And the thing is, novelty is a motherfucker. Anybody knows that when they get really, really good, when they top out with a movement, subtle changes to that movement are a way of like restarting new beginnings. Because over the first few weeks, even if it's just neurological, you find yourself getting getting used to the movement and you get some easy PRs, but that also represents new stress. And if it's similar enough to the exercise you were doing before or to the goals that you have, the end result is going to be net progress overall, which again is why we go through different phases of training to incorporate this bit of novelty. And you even see this in the other awesome things that they recommend. You uh, he's flying way too fast and off the deep end. Um, so, you know, saying that you can't just have something that's optimal all the time, that you can't judge um, a program's validity on the growth it produces because eventually it'll stop producing the result. It's simply not true. Um, you know, really you're going to get diminishing returns. The better you get at something and the longer you do it, the less returns you're going to get on it. That doesn't mean you have to start doing something different. Okay. Now, these guys are all using the basis of their comp, their, their, they're chasing multiple different adaptations. You know, their goal isn't specifically one thing. Like my goal, for instance, it's specifically hypertrophy. That is the only goal I care about is growing bigger, larger muscles, not getting fat. And then one day or 
for a few weeks out of the year, I decide to get really fucking shredded and see how big I made my muscles. Okay. So that's the specificity. There is a system that will always produce returns. And there's very few variables I need to change on that. You don't need to swap over to go do something different. You don't need to throw in all this novelty. It's, it's really is that simple. Um, the things Bromley is talking about is not hypertrophy. He's talking about just maintaining, trying to maintain and switch between all these different adaptations. You know, when his progress stalls on X lift, it's probably because he's, you know, exceeded his recovery capacity. So what would be the logical thing to do there? Well, it would be to add more rest or to reduce some volume. But no, they don't do that. So what do they do? Well, let's chase another kind of adaptation. Let's change this out. So it'll be relatively new to our mylar sheath, you know, our nervous system body movement pattern. And then we pick this new thing and then we get better at that new thing for a little while. Well, then we got to switch over and do something else. So they keep throwing in this novelty stuff, you know. It's Dory Nace did the same fucking exercises for his entire Olympia career. And like progressively overloaded on all of them the whole time and got better and better and better and better until he retired. Um. That's just simply not true. You yeah. can have a system that works and you don't need to change it. It's all about the fundamentals. And if you're operating within the confines of objective reality, those fundamentals will always apply. Intensity is number one. Volume and frequency must be reduced to maintain progression over time. <clears throat> That's yeah, I think people hypertrophy get specific training. Yeah, people get it so confused. Like, if you're training for hypertrophy, there's one way to do it. But people people try to mix in str getting stronger, you know, like get, doing strength movements or doing, you know, you know, th all these other things. It's like we're building muscle here. That's our goal is to build muscle. Like you said, bigger, bigger muscles. People get to try to do way too much. It's like choose one yeah. or the other. Do you want to be a power lifter or do you want to be a bodybuilder? You know, figure it out. Yeah. And like Bromley, you know, his programming or his mindset when walking into this, you can tell by his exercise selection and his philosophy on the matter. He's chasing different adaptations altogether. He's wanting to get stronger on specific lifts and get hypertrophy and maintain um, workloads or like, you know, high levels of being able to tolerate high levels of volume all at once. So, yeah. He's going to be constantly periodizing between these three different things. <laughs> He's going to have different <laughs> phases for all of those because once you tap out on one, you know, these two are going to suffer. Then you notice these two suffer. Then you focus on this one. Then you focus on this one. Again, all based on a false premise. You know, you need, every training system is specifically for something. There's, it's all about specificity. Heavy duty, high intensity training, as taught by us here at the Iconocast, is hypertrophy specific. And that's it. And you can do the same thing indefinitely and produce results until you reach your genetic or biological limits. Okay. I have recently enhanced my biological capacity with pharmaceutical grade human growth hormone, Trestolone, uh, and Primabolin. And I can train once every three days instead of once every five. And I could do significantly more volume for my arms. But the fundamental laws by which I operate, you know, the, my, my core philosophy has not changed. I've merely added the ability to handle or to recover better. And I did that chemically. Okay. Now, if I wasn't to have those chemicals in place, I'd still operate by the same system and I'd be training once every five days. Or eventually it might even turn into less than that. Thousand percent. Look at something like myo reps, which was designed based off of the idea of effective or stimulating reps. Instead of doing a drop set where you do 10 fail, then drop weight, and then do like 15, which is like 10 useless reps, and then you start to fail again. Why don't you just take a 10 second break, do a couple, take a 10 second break, do a couple where most people think, oh, it doesn't burn as much or whatever. You're actually getting a lot of effective reps by doing that. So there's some rationale to it being a superior way of getting a growth stimulus. However, if that's the case, why isn't every single set done that way? And the answer is because they need variety to hedge their fucking bets because people like Israel intuit 
that there are different protocols that work well in different ways and that this isn't so obviously the best way of doing things that we're going to put all our eggs in that basket. This is yet another reason to have variety. If you ask any exercise science guy, if somebody should only do this range, you're going to find them stutter, stammer, say, well, maybe, well, maybe variety is probably a good idea. Of course it fucking is. And there absolutely isn't any reason to think that as far as hypertrophy is concerned, that that wouldn't be the case with technical execution to an individual who is extremely habituated to the same method of execution. And this is why optimal just makes my blood boil because it's the illusion of some hypothetical perfect return and all it does is just give people FOMO, constantly sidelining effort, never really committing to what they're doing now because they're on the hunt for the thing that when they find it, oh my God, it's gonna pay off, it's gonna be huge. This is the equivalent of people investing, settling for like the boring, slow, predictable growth of a diversified portfolio that gives like 7% every year like clockwork. That's night and day to the people that chase the Bitcoin halving cycle because they think that's going to be the one big hit that's going to make them wealthy. In the realm of all possibilities, there is some theoretical arrangement of all the variables that lead you to being fucking Superman. The problem is you're not going to find it. And if you go about as if you're going to find it, you're going to waste all the vital and might I add limited years you have to do something now that leaves you better than when you started. You have to assume that of all the training variables that exist, yours aren't going to be perfect. A verbo is for sharing all kinds of moments. I think it's very easy to have your identity kind of be wrapped up in one style of training. Oh, you're a hit guy. Oh, you only do one set. I don't do more than one set, bro. Okay, well, maybe you'd be better if you did more than one set. Now your identity is control. Like, you're the guy who's controlled. You want to be the guy who knows how to manipulate all the variables and how they interact in order to get the most from your training. And that cuts to the core of why people do this. I mean, there's layers here beyond the goal of finding what is truest in an academic sense. I mean, you have a lot of people viewing this content. You have seasoned vets looking for their next competitive edge. You have people that are novices looking for their first bicep vein. You have people that haven't even been in a gym yet. So if you're going to try and find a piece of advice that you can fit in a single tweet that's going to apply to everybody, it has to be broad. It has to remove all the resolution because the second you start dealing with the individual, the whole game changes. It reminds me of the discussions we've had in the past about back issues where I've gone back and forth with like barbell medicine. I'm a competitive You're strong man. I blew my back out like 19 times over 10 years trying You're to jump Bailey. into contests okay, where there was go. fixed <laughs> yokes, farmers, laws. I was saying that we have that. Exceeded what we have that exact thing. We have a broad overlapping philosophy that applies to everyone at all levels. And with the set of heuristics provided for that philosophy, it becomes tailored to every individual and it's all within one package from the super advanced to the guy that's never set in the gym set foot in the gym the principles of high intensity training apply to each one of them because they are fundamentally and universally true with the right set of heuristics you can tailor every person's program to their individual genetic potential and biological function. You see, and we've talked about this too on the show, like that's the breakaway. See, he's getting to the breakaway of, well, there's a little something, you know, everybody needs a little something different. Everybody needs this or everybody, you know, it's not the same. Um, you know, all things have merit. It's just when you need to apply them, it's like, no, there are universal truths. I will be adamant about that in regards to hypertrophy specific training yeah, we're it. all human we all have muscles and they all they all can grow with the same set of heuristics yeah when they grow when the mechanical tension is applied to them mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. no different for anybody <laughs> yep for sure but I was justified in trying to lift. And that's the nature of the sport. So given my injuries, all the people I've coached who have had injuries, all the other pros I know in the sport who have had injuries, I made it a mission to let people know that, hey, I know you wanna go just deadlift as much as you can, as often as you can, and try and make your way to that national level event, but you're probably better off taking your time, slowing progress, getting a sound technical base, addressing weaknesses before they develop. And if you do that, you can get very strong and also have a very wide, well-rounded base. It'll keep you injury-free. On the other hand, you have barbell medicine, who is really concerned with the broad health 
effects of lifting to the population at large. And they recognize that if you take the average person, have them train, get their strength to go up 50% in their lifetime, they're going to have lower rates of diabetes. They're going to have more bone density. They're going to live longer. A bunch of health outcomes are going to improve over the population. So the cost to scaring them off by making them worry about rigid technical standards or the likelihood of injury doesn't outweigh the benefit of what I think is preaching sound injury prevention and performance enhancing standards. Does it mean that one of us is really right and the other one is really wrong? Well, obviously I'm right, but really it means that we're talking about two different populations and it doesn't quite meet up in the middle the way we want to. We end up talking over each other's heads. Similarly, with all the people that consume the content that we put out, the fact is, not every single person is actually motivated to getting as good as they can potentially be. In fact, most of them would reject a truly optimal program if it required them working harder than they wanted to, spending more time in the gym than they want to do, doing exercises they don't like, or spending attention on time and sleep. Not all, but surely some want to be able to lift on their own terms and then still signal to everybody else that, hey, I know how to lift the right way. I did the research. This is scientifically approved. You don't need to see it in how big their arms are or in what contests they win. You know because there's studies and there's a group of people with PhDs affirming that you got it, bud, you're on the right track. They might not go from six hours of weekly training training to eight, they might work on increasing their tolerance to pain during difficult sets, but God damn it, do they stretch the hell out of those bent rows. And this is an example of the students making the syllabus because we as creators get captured by our audience and we tend to put out things that get the biggest response. Actually, it makes it very difficult to put out things we might think are pressing because we often get punished quite heavily for the time and effort we put into things that we might think are necessary because our generalized audience has selected us based on the things that they like to see. It's actually a very big problem and it's one that I deal with on a weekly basis when I'm trying to make content. So if you've done a good job of procuring for yourself a bunch of viewers that really want all of the super sciencey shit, all of the little formally discovered tidbits that have peer reviewed research behind it, you are then heavily incentivized to keep giving them that content. There's no reason not to. However, the outcomes you get and the methods you prescribe in service of those outcomes are going to be just wildly fucking different than if you were heading a small population of barbarians that were so dead set on becoming the next big thing in bodybuilding that they were willing to break themselves against whatever they thought might get them there. Does it mean that one tactic is absolutely right versus the other? No, but it does mean that the populations are different, the goals are different, and the recommendations have to be fucking different. Where the stakes are highest, you're gonna tend to see the most productive things being cycled over and over. At the very least, things that aren't actively going to hold you back. And the only stakes here are the Girl Scout badges that these people can sew on their sash to signal to the rest of their friends that they're part of the initiated crew. They're the control guys, and we know better. And when you have enough friends that have the same badges, oh, what about on their sash, you, Bromley? What about me, the volume guy? The fact that their sash it's like he doesn't have any. He's accusing Mike Isertel of doing all the things that he does, mm -hmm. right? It, he's he, and Mike does all the shit. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong; we clown both of these guys. You know, we go over both of their content and just show how they are erroneously and systematically wrong, over and over. Um, you know, talking about producing content for an echo chamber. You know, what happened when you made that video about high intensity training and you got absolutely you quote unquote were taking grenades in the comment. You went on to make a four part video series. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's right. On why this was just the most abhorrent thing ever. You know, and what did you stick to your guns with? Volume, 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 volume. OK. Um, Mike Isertel does the same thing. OK, why did you do that? Because, you know, if this one thing was true, then you have to fall back on all the other stuff you taught. Yeah, you got to retract you have a all site. that. Right, because you have 500 programs on the link below this video that are for sale. And none of them are based on, you know, this philosophy um, with controllable objective variables that is logical and makes sense. In the hit video series, Brownlee talked about how – you and I, Gage, are not initiated. We don't know how to read the studies. We are not um, qualified to make the kind of the, the, the. We're not qualified to speak on the things we speak on. We don't understand it. We don't quote unquote speak the language. Yeah, he's saying the, the exact circle. same thing about Mike Isertel. Mike Isertel and all his PhD buddies, you know, all patting themselves on the back, saying that they, you know, they know how to read it. Mike's doing it too. Bromley does it. They all do it. And now they're sitting here arguing over 
who's who's right. You know, now Bromley's saying a lot of good stuff in this video, and he's 100% right, but he doesn't even have the foundation. You know, yeah, he's got a bunch right. Focus on injury prevention. How did you do that? Um, have adequate rest in your training and don't work too freaking much. Don't, yeah, don't grind yourself into too. oblivion. You know, that's yeah. injury prevention. Right. Injury prevention is resting more than you train. Imagine that. Um, focus on your sleep. Focus on the fundamentals like effort and progressively overloading. That's all beautiful stuff. He's 100% right. But if you don't have a basic philosophy that is specific to the goal you're trying to get to. Then you're just. Yeah. Then you guys are going to be barking yeah. at each other, you know, through the fence. And neither one of you are going anywhere. You're definitely not going to get each other. Um, no. But he's accusing Mike of doing all the stuff that he does, too. Um, you know, he called himself the qualified one. He called everybody else, you know, the uninitiated, not intelligent enough to do it. And now, you know, he's picking on Mike because Mike is saying that all him and his buddies talk, you know, the whole team full ROM deal. Saying that that's reality, wrong. Yeah. They're both yeah, they're as twisted just... as each other. They <laughs> yeah. Both do the same crap. <sighs> And, you know, to take the shots, to be egalitarian about it and to say, like, you know, as he threw those shots in there, that you can't just say that you have this one thing that's right and applies to all people. That's yeah, 100% what we're thing. doing. That's right, what we're doing on the show right here, right now, is I'm telling you that there is one system that is absolutely superior for hypertrophy. And I've made 41 episodes of this show explaining how that's right. <laughs> Every fucking training blog I have, you know, um, but it's to appeal to that egalitarian thing where everyone's ideas have merit. Everyone, you know, it's all different populations of people, you know, with different needs. Well, yeah, if they got different specific goals, then okay, whatever. Yeah, but should be, yeah, it shouldn't be specific needs. It should be worded specific wants, what you want to, to achieve. I like this example of uh, all the barbarians just throwing themselves <laughs> at the wall until whoever can get through, which is um, sadly, that's what most bodybuilding is. You know, it's who, who has the best genetics and the drugs to actually break through that wall while the rest yeah. of them stay on the other side and don't get through, you know. Who can who can fun. handle all the, the volume and all that? Yeah. And all the, the typical bodybuilding right. training. Yeah. And that is the same exact thing he teaches people to do. That's why he says, oh, well, you know, volume is king because look at all the people who are successful by running into that wall. Well, look at all the people. What about conjugate program? What about conjugate, dude? <laughs> yeah, conjugate was good for whoever could survive that shit. It's the same stuff, man. He makes the same exact arguments that Mike Isertel makes. And now they're pitting, you know, they're arguing against each other. Spinning them circles around here. Interesting. Thing of merit, competitive wins, coaching accolades, even success in meeting the most basic physical standards for anybody who's been training for a couple of years. And everybody has to admit, and this exists in me and probably you as well, that our sense of identity and the way we feel about the way we train is a big driver of why we do it probably more so than whether or not it is tangibly going to give us the best result. The goal of getting a physically impressive physique is just one of many. And to many of us, we're not going to rearrange our lives and actively engage in something we don't like doing if it doesn't pique our interest in the same way. And that's fine. I think joy and the love of training a certain way is absolutely vital to training. And this is my basic premise, actually. This is what justifies my push against the direction that exercise science is taking things. I think we can bring the pendulum back to a point where people actually drive their training by things that are broadly effective, but that also bring them joy, inspire hope or a sense of accomplishment or something that is just stimulating. If it checks a few big boxes and you love to do it and you do it over and over and over, you're likely to have better results than if you do anything else. Because again, it's not about what you do right now. It's about how many times you can repeat those little improvements in performance. Now, aside from the fact that you do enjoy it, the only real reason to be really loyal to a method of lifting is because that is the thing that 
made you the stud that you are. And where after years of grinding, you just developed a sick fucking package. And now you look back and think, God damn, am I glad that I took that path because I don't think I would have been here without it. But before you've made it there, your loyalty to anything, even the shit you hear from me is completely unjustified. So I thought this was a really good piece by Jeffrey Barry Schofield. I agreed with so many of his takes. Shifting content aside, I'm still generally a fan of Dr. Mike. I think he still gives pretty measured takes, but I think it gives us a lot to sink our teeth into. It gives us an enemy to push back against so we can define what it is that we believe and why we train. And as I go on, I'm going to try to really see, define more clearly, the draw out the boundaries. He, he was just talking about how it's not about what's objectively true or verifiable. It's, you know, at a certain point, it's about what feels good and what you like doing. Um, there's nothing concrete against that. And there is no philosophy behind that. Um, so what are you even pushing back against? You know, you're pushing back against Mike trying to be concrete and trying to be absolutist, yet you yourself have no absolute value. You have no, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Crap. I wish Ben was here. He's smarter than me. But that doesn't exist with him, you know? Um, there absolutely is concrete truth. And the truth doesn't care about your feelings. Your feelings don't fucking matter. You know, yes, do what you like to do, but that doesn't make it right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't make yeah. it effective. It doesn't make it true. <sighs> yeah, it's like dudes that love to go in the gym and just, you know, train for a pump, 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 because it feels good, you know, doing higher volume because you get a sick pump and it's like, you know, it makes you happy. Sure. But is that the most optimal thing you could be doing? Absolutely no. not. But I guess what that's is, just kind of the way of things is to do what feels good. You know, just, hey, just follow your heart. Whatever, <laughs> whatever it makes you smile, it's going to take you all the way. Yeah, it is, I believe, <laughs> because I've done the competitive thing. I've broken myself in the gym. And now I'm at a stage in my life where competing is optional. It only happens when it fits the more important things. And I have to decide what my best avenue for training is moving forward. The more I think about it, the more I realize how big of a toolbox of potential methods we have to pull from. And that there's really no reason for me not to pull the ones that fit my lifestyle, fit my resources, my time and energy, and most importantly, my sense of joy and purpose that I get from doing. And fellas, there's no doubt in my mind that if we create a movement of lifters who lift according to that, as opposed to what they find optimal, the difference in physiques between the two camps is gonna be so stupid, it's not even gonna be close. Not that it's a contest, of course. So that's all I got for today, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you. Get him out of here. I was hearing something else in my inputs, but um, yeah, that last bit about uh, the the two different camps. If everybody just did what feels good and realized that there's this big broad toolbox that they could pull all kind of shit out of. Um, number one, if you are passionate about making progress and like really wanting to see changes, you know, you want to change your body, you want to lose body weight, you want to put on some muscle. Um, that is your goal and that is your focus. And you, there is a system that's based on reality, that's objectively true, 100%, that doesn't require all your time and effort. It gives you more freedom. You don't have to live in the gym. You don't have to break yourself in the gym. Like Bromley said in that video, I critiqued, um, you know, how he was mad that Arthur Jones created these machines that you could do one set of. And he was upset that, you know, they didn't have to, fiddle with clunky weights for hours a day. You don't have to do that to reach your goal. Right. You know, your, your passion should be your progress, not drowning out some kind of feeling. If you have aspirations to be a world-class strength athlete, then by the nature of becoming a world-class strength athlete is this different kind of periodization training that is going to completely absorb your life. But if you just want a bigger, you know, you want a little bit, you want a better physique, you want to look better, you want to feel better. 
You don't need a giant toolbox full of stuff. You don't have to do that. You don't have to endlessly pick through different things, man. You could train one to three times a week and see consistent progress over years to come. And it's very simple. It does not require a huge investment of your time. Um, I'm in the same place as Bromley. <laughs> you know, competing is 100% optional for me. I've got two small children. I work a full-time job. I've got a coaching business. And I'm still a, a competitive bodybuilder who's going to compete at a high level. And I train very infrequently. And I don't train with a lot of volume. And I don't break myself in the gym. I don't have to do that. Why? Because I have the one tool that's needed. You know, you got a, a toolbox. It, it, I love uh, thinking about the analogy. A toolbox has a bunch of different tools to get a bunch of different jobs done. You don't use a ratchet wrench to drive nails. You don't use a screwdriver to cut wood. All of these things are very specific for whatever goal it is that you have in mind. All of these people, what he described as, you know, everybody operating in a certain way and their camp will be better than the meticulous camp. Everyone's already doing that. Everyone's out there trying different stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. No one has any passion for the real actual goal at hand. It is to self-soothe and to keep themselves busy and uh, just participate well, in the gym as a social act. Yeah, their social ritual. Right. So they've got a big old toolbox yeah. that they can keep going in and finding a reason to keep doing the same erroneous things over and over. We're going in circles. It's quite sad. Instead of a, instead of a toolbox, it should be a, for, for us. It's like a fishing box. We've got everything we need for fishing, putting on muscle. That's we beautiful. don't have all these different... We don't have all these different things. We have one. Our box has got one go on it. We take that to the lake. That's what we need. Right. I like that. Right. I like that and, and I've got, analogy. Yeah, I like the tackle box analogy because within the tackle box, the goal is to catch fish, but you can also catch specific kind of fish. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. you can go, hey, I got my bass lures over here. I got my stuff to do uh, bottom fishing. You know, I catch catfish with this. I got bass lures. I got fly stuff. I got, you know, but I'm fishing. It's, it's a fishing all fish. box. It's yep. all fish. Specific to fishing. I love it. Well, I like that. I like that a lot. Well, I think this is probably the stalest episode I've ever done yet. Um, <laughs> it was very unprepared. We had other things on the docket, but we couldn't get Ben. I couldn't get Ben to show up. So that kind of sucked. And yeah. then I figured I'd just wing it. Um, that video was just too fast to break down systematically. Uh, and again, it's hard to kind of even cover that content when the foundations are just totally twisted up. You know, because there's no actual definitive goal that either um, camp was looking for. I guess maybe Mike's was hypertrophy, but again, his foundations are totally screwed. So he doesn't even have a philosophy. Neither one of them have a coherent philosophy for what goals they are trying to achieve. So everything that you stack on top of that is just sliding all over the place and it, it's just a big mess. But to be expected, I suppose. Yeah, it's it's a big mess out there, especially on the internet. <sighs> yeah, well said. But we try to clean it up, guys. We try to make it really easy for you, simple, tangible, digestible, understandable. Because it is. It really, really is. And any person that has come to me and worked with me has seen that. They've never once turned to me and said, well, I'm so glad I did what I've been doing for so long. Like Bromley's mm -hmm. example. You know, none of them ever looked at me and said, man, I'm actually, you know what? I'm happy I went my way. They said, wow, I could have been doing things so much better the whole time and save myself so much time, effort and my body. Yeah, like you could have went back and done it. Uh, uh, yeah, like you could have went back and like when you look back and you're like, oh, I did high volume and all this. Like, yeah, it works. But if you could have gone back, you could have had, you know, so many more days of the week to venture into other things in your life, you know, and more time to, to spend in those other areas. So yeah. yeah. 
People hate. Imagine um, how good I'd be at playing guitar. Just dude, seriously, you know, <laughs> anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had a guy, um, I put a little clip up on my YouTube and, um, a guy commented, he's like, you know, what, what, what has been the benefits you've seen of Mike's high intensity training? And I listed, you know, you feel better, your joints feel better, your muscles aren't inflamed. And I said, you know, aside from the physical things, it's the time to do whatever you want. You know, you can go read, go on hikes, spend time with the family, go on trips, you know, put effort into a business, you know, study a faith, all these things, you know, and it's like, people just can't, people can't get their head out of five, six days a week in the gym. You know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to get it into people's heads any, you know, more simply, but that's what we're here for. I think what you, what you just said there kind of um, shines a big light on the whole video we just watched. The identities of both parties involved in this argument is the gym mm -hmm. the identity is the gym um whereas what you were just saying is that you know your identity is this whole life that you can create and having this way to specifically reach your goal here can allow you to do all of these other things better it's the complete opposite yeah, we don't we don't slave in the gym anymore. People want to hate on us, call us lazy, call us whatever, but we don't want to be in the gym five, six days a week. We got other shit going on we want to deal with. So, well, and it goes back to what I said that earlier is that my goal and my passion is to get progress out of what I'm doing in the gym. And therefore, training that often and that, you know, with that much, it's counterintuitive to my goal. Right. You yeah, know. it's not to say and we I don't love. This. I love being in the gym, but I like making. I like get, making gains more. Yes, hundred percent, one hundred percent. I like my progress way more than I like being in the gym. Therefore, there's a there's a split in the road there. And yep. if I decided to stay in because I loved it so much, I would try. To, I would have to have a big toolbox full of all kind of different stuff to put everything back together so that I could keep maintaining you know, staying in there the whole time. I would be periodizing between uh, different adaptations and all these new little goals that would constantly have to keep up with to keep me in there mm -hmm. when I don't need to do that. You know, my goal is to have a bigger, stronger, better looking body. And yeah, my goal isn't to stay in the gym five days a week. Key difference there. Yeah. Well, guys, I kind of spent. <laughs> we'll have some content <laughs> prepared for next week. We were really hoping for Ben. We were going to get into some PT stuff, and and uh, we had a really fun topic. It was going to be kind of like a an inner Iconocast uh, panel debate uh, with some really good information on it. Um, but, you know, things happen. I had to throw this together at the last minute. Didn't do so well, but hope you enjoyed some of it, maybe. You know, I think we had some good content. I think we had some good points. No, there was definitely some good points in there. Um, it just was, I'm trying to eat peanut butter jellies and Bromley's going real fast. And <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> saying really good stuff. <laughs> yeah, saying really good stuff with crap mixed in. It was a little confusing. But um, yeah, man, uh, the merch, the Gumroad, Zeke Friday at gumroad.com. You got nattyduty.com. If you're natty and you do the duty, then you can get you one of those. <laughs> um, again, Paywall for previous episodes, which are much better than this one. <laughs> the archive is uh, on the gum road as well. So show us your support. Show us your love. I am Primar Billy. This is Natty Duty. Producer E is on that side. And we are the Iconocast. And we'll have an episode ready for you next Friday. Uh, Absolutely. Hopefully my boy Ben will be here, man. We got to get Ben back on the show. If he doesn't go, we're gonna we're gonna arrest him for, gonna, for yeah, gonna uh, arrest him. not showing up. He's gonna <laughs> send him to the gulag. The re yeah, send him, camp. send him to the re-education camp, man. All he has to watch are freaking Bromley and Israel videos the whole time, always playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. All right, guys. Well, we are out. 
Adios. Thanks, Eric. Peace. Stay fucking hard. In order to train as hard as possible, you must retain a clear image of your purpose. Once your goal is sharply but realistically defined, all that remains is carrying out your plan. Don't, however, worry about your individual potential. Potential is only the expression of a possibility, something that can be assessed accurately only in retrospect. In other words, you'll never know how good you might have become unless you try. So let's get with it.